Welcome to Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop, where you'll find the unique, the bizarre, and sometimes the haunted. Feel free to look around, peruse the items, and never fear. There's nothing here that bites. Hard, anyway. <laughs> ah, hello there. So wonderful to see you've returned once again to Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop. I am your shopkeeper, Chris Baker, and today we've got, well, something we looked at this past Monday, this uh, very interesting apothecary case. A chest, if you will, wooden in nature, with brass hinges and clasps. And as we opened up on this past Monday's episode, we saw the vials and all of the accoutrements necessary for mixing and creating herbal and folk remedies. Now, as one might create some remedy with hallucinatory properties, as our last episode of Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop bore witness, today's episode of Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop delves more into the folk traditions and remedies of the past, as we take a look by pulling out the kinetoscope and delving into the shutter film Nocebo. So, Nocebo came out on Shudder. It was released here in the States. It says in January, but I really didn't see this on Shudder until probably mid-February. Um, a couple weeks ago, I would say, is when I really first started started noticing Nocebo. And, and that really is because that is when it showed up on the recently added list on Shudder. Now, I know sometimes Shudder adds things to their lineup, but doesn't really feature it on their just added list. So it, it may have been there for a while, but I really didn't notice it until a couple weeks ago. And it was one of those movies where, okay, yeah, I got to watch this. It seems interesting. Uh, I really like the cast. Uh, so I... I decided to finally sit down and watch this movie because, uh, like I said on last week's episode, I really wanted to talk about Children of the Corn this week, but the theater where I live wasn't showing it. I wasn't going to drive 35 miles away to watch it up in Erie just to be pissed off that I spent good money on a movie that I'm pretty sure is going to suck. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that when that comes out on Shudder. I believe March the 21st we'll be talking about Children of the Corn, or at least Children of the Corn will be available on Shudder, and then we'll talk talk about it the the following uh, episode but I was like I I want to watch something that that I'm gonna enjoy talking about and I watched nocebo and I was excited to be able to talk about this much like spoonful of sugar that we talked about on Monday uh, it, it very much has very similar ties each of them has a nanny that has uh, some sort of ill will and nefarious intent in mind and both of them deal with alternative therapies and remedies and in this one kind of leans you know where where spoonful of sugar dealt into the psychotropic therapies this delves into nocebo does into more holistic and natural alternative remedies so that was kind of funny uh maybe not in a ha-ha way but funny ironically that both of these movies come out on shutter just about the same time and like i said i, I really dug the cast of this movie uh so that really kind of made me latch on to this and and really want to give this movie a go. So first off, I, I want to mention that this movie is directed by Lorcan Finnegan, who you may or may not know from the movie Vivarium back in 2019, which was a movie. It starred Imogen Poots and Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, really interesting, bizarre, weird movie that uh, I just was entranced by. I know uh, some people didn't like it because it was uh, it was a bit of a slow burn, but uh, but I think once you got where you were going, it was just fasc a fascinating movie to watch. And, and so well acted and so well directed. Uh, I, I loved Vivarium. So when I found out uh, that Lorcan Finnegan was directing this movie, Nocebo, I was like, okay, I'm on board. Not to mention the fact that it really has a rock solid cast. So uh, I was really excited to see all those elements put out front. And then the, the kind of synopsis of the movie really felt interesting. Uh, maybe nothing new. Uh, this movie is not groundbreaking. And in, in some regards, probably my biggest complaint is that some of the elements that 
uh, should have been more of a mystery. Uh, you really kind of figured out what was going on really quickly. But outside of that, uh, a fantastic movie, I thought. So we're going to dive into to my thoughts on, on this movie, Nocebo. And I, I'm going to warn you right up front that this movie, uh, we're going to have some spoilers here because I'm going to talk about the movie. And I can't talk about it without talking about it and talking about the things that happen and, uh, and the characters and, and what they go through. And there are going to be a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't watched Nocebo, go check it out on Shudder. Uh, if you don't have Shudder, get it because you're going to be really pleasantly surprised if you're a horror fan, how much good original content, not to mention the old, uh, all of the classic content that's on there and some of those those old movies that maybe you've heard about but you never had a chance to see. Uh, like I said, I, I'm not being paid to pimp for for shutter but uh, if you're a horror fan it really is worth the the few bucks a month to check it out and check out a really good movie like nocebo like i said before in our last episode shutter has really been doubling down and really getting where where original content on netflix is so hit or miss especially when it comes to horror and with horror on netflix it is more miss uh than hit and and if you get a good horror sci-fi show, they're probably going to cancel it after a season because they didn't binge it because it's not the latest, you know, shitty reality show or lowest common denominator bullshit that that people just eat up uh, like hotcakes. But but at any rate, uh, go check out Nocebo if you haven't watched it, uh, and and then come back and hear my thoughts on it, and then maybe you know compare and contrast notes. And if you haven't watched it. But you don't care about spoilers, then we're going to press on. And if you've watched it, please, uh, you know, see if we uh, have the same ideas about uh, what's going on with this movie. But uh, from here on out, there are going to be spoilers. But the one of the things that I found was interesting listening to some interviews with uh, Lorcan Finnegan is the whole idea and the process where this movie got started, and and talking about nocebos, which. Uh, if you're not familiar with the word, I had heard it. I didn't have a really complete understanding of the idea behind nocebos, but it's it's kind of the opposite of a placebo, where a placebo is a a not even a medicine, but it's something given to somebody who is expecting positive results from it, and because of those positive expectations, they experience positive results from this. Uh, fake medication, so to speak, where nocebo is uh, the exact opposite, where you're you're given something and you're expecting negative results. And because this isn't anything that is going to affect you for good or ill, uh, because you have those negative thoughts and those negative expectations of this pill, uh, you're going to experience negative outcomes and negative experiences with, with the, like I said, fake medication. So right there, that's a, an interesting concept, uh, an interesting jumping off point. And how it ties into the movie, that that really is up to the, you know, the beauties in the eye of the beholder. Uh, the nocebo is in the mouth of the swallower, I guess you could say. But, uh, but we're going to talk about this movie. The basic premise of this movie is that you have this children's wear designer, Christine. She has a family, her husband uh, and her young daughter. She's, uh, you know, very successful early on. She's she's doing things. She's moving and shaking. She's doing it all on her own. She's designing the clothes. She's getting them manufactured. She's working on distribution. She's, you know, promoting them, uh, that sort of thing. She's, just, you know, a very strong woman. And then something happens in this first scene that we we don't really understand completely. She gets a phone call and you hear about bodies being pulled from the wreckage and, and things like that. And you're, you're like, oh my God, I thought it was maybe her husband that something happened to him or her child. And no, it, it wasn't either of them because the next scene we see both those characters. So you're not sure what happens. But all of a sudden she has this vision of this dog, just like a... A uh, very misty-eyed dog that looks almost rotting. It has ticks all over it. And this dog is staring at her. She stares at it while she's on this phone. And then all of a sudden the dog shakes. These ticks go flying everywhere. And she gets one on the back of her neck. When we pick up, I believe, six months later, six or eight months after the the events of this first scene in the movie, she is a totally different woman. 
debilitated by this mysterious illness that has her crippled. I mean, she she can't function at work. She can't function at home. She has tremors. She's afraid to go out. She has memory loss. All these different things afflicting her, and nobody can explain why, and the medication's not working. And in walks this new nanny that she doesn't even remember contacting. But this woman shows up saying she contacted her to come help her. And she's going to take care of the daughter and kind of do some some household chores, things like that. Just kind of help her keep things in order in her home. And then that's where we find out that this nanny is not quite uh, matching the bill of sale, if you will. It almost feels like there's something else going on with this nanny that shows up so we're going to talk about this movie as we we try to do take a look at it from the lens of the characters and what are going what's going on with the characters in these stories and the actors that portray them and then the you know the portrayal that we get and then kind of uh go from there and talk about some of the highlights of this movie but the main star of this is evergreen at first i didn't recognize the name And I'm like, okay, uh, she seems familiar. I I don't know where I've seen her before. But then, you know, I'm kind of looking. Oh, yeah, that's right. She played the Vesper Lind character in Casino Royale, that Daniel Craig James Bond movie. Uh, You know, a couple other things that I've seen her in. A couple uh, 300 sequel, the Sin City sequel. She's done some other things here and there that I've heard of. But then it dawned on me that she played the Vanessa Ives character from Penny Dreadful, which I was a a huge fan of. So once I realized who she was, you know, one, I had that (laughs) that mental weight off my mind realizing who she is. But uh, but she's a a fantastic actress. I really loved her in Penny Dreadful and I've loved her in some of the other things I've seen her in. Uh, So I knew that we were going to have a quality actress here playing this this main role of Christine. And when we meet her, like I said, at the very beginning, she's a very strong woman. Uh, she has a, a, a an interesting relationship with her daughter. Uh, I, I thought the first kind of interaction between these two, uh, discussing what was a bad swear word, <laughs> because the little girl says, Jesus, and the mother says, you know, don't say bad words. And that's not a bad word. That's just a man's name. And then, of course, uh, she says shit, and that's even worse. And, and and the back and forth between these two, it's it's not your typical mother daughter relationship, but it is a very good and and caring mother daughter relationship. It feels uh, the relationship between Christine and her husband Felix uh, seems a little different, and it becomes even more strained throughout the the events of this movie but we'll we'll get to the Felix character in a little bit but but we see this very strong woman at the beginning very successful woman like I said she's moving and shaking things she's doing things on her own she don't need nobody's help uh, and then when this event happens that that shakes her and she just like I said becomes debilitated by this unknown illness whether it's physical whether it's psychological uh, they never really can pinpoint it and it's never really pinpointed in the movie you have to imagine it's it's more psychological than anything but she is a broken woman she's a shell of the woman she was she becomes distant with her husband and you know he's a very concerned and, and caring husband but you know, it's it, you almost feel like he's at his wit's end. He just doesn't know what to do to help her. You see the relationship between her and her daughter even more strained because, you know, she's just not there. And even when she's there, she's not there. You know, she worked a lot before, so she was never there for her daughter. And now that she's not working as much, she's still not there for her daughter because she's just kind of off in La La Land, kind of off in the Twilight Zone half the time because of, because of this illness that she has. She just kind of stays away from everyone. But that's one of the things I really liked about Evergreen's portrayal of this character because she portrayed the strength. You know, in the moments where she needed to be strong and confident, she did a really good job with that. In the moments where she needed to be weak and vulnerable, she did a really good job with that. In the moments where she had to be scared and confused because she just didn't know what the hell was going on with her, whether it be uh, when she's going when they're through one of her episodes or whether she's going through some of the alternative uh, folk remedy therapy sessions with the other character, Diana, uh, she really plays all this, this myriad of emotions and this myriad of personality traits that 
really does a fantastic job with it and is is quite good uh, and, and why I enjoy uh, Evergreen as an actress so much. Now, the other character in this husband-wife duo is Felix, played by Mark Strong. And Mark Strong's another one of those actors you've probably... I, I At first, I was like, ah, I've, I've seen him in, in so many things, uh, and I couldn't put my finger on it. But but then once you start looking into it and, and remembering, you, you realize all of the different things he's been in. He's been in so many different movies. He was a kick-ass... Uh, 2010's Robin Hood. Uh, he was in Green Lantern, The Imitation Game, Kingsman movies. So he, he's been in a ton of uh, different films and, and TV series. Uh, so uh, again, another very accomplished actor and a very good actor. But he plays this character, Felix. He's Christine's husband. And yeah, at, at first you don't really get to know too much about him or his relationship with Christine. But after the events of the, the first scene of the movie where she's kind of been broken... Uh, you really get a sense of he's he's a strong man, he's a caring man, he's a protective man, protective of his family, but he's he's also very much at his wit's end. It feels like he just doesn't know what to do. You know, he can't fix this through uh, you know brute force or the other things that you know alpha male guys want to do to solve problems. He wants to be able to fix this and protect his wife, but he just doesn't know how, and that puts a strain on their relationship. And and there's a distance in their relationship. There's a comment where they're sitting on the couch and he's like, I didn't even think you wanted to touch me anymore because she has kind of pulled back into herself because of what's going on with her. And not only is she not there for her daughter, but she's also not there for her husband. So you have this character who has the complication of not being able to help his wife and not feeling like his wife even really wants him around either. But he is the character that, you know, once this nanny is brought into the situation and uh, he's, the, he's the doubting Thomas, when Christina is finding that she's having results with this alternative therapy with this nanny, uh, Felix is the one that just doesn't believe it. He looks at this nanny, Diana, as the snake oil salesman that's come to town and is is pulling the wool over everyone's eyes for for some gains, he's not quite sure what it is, but but he feels that there's something off about this whole thing. And and like I said, Mark Strong does a really good job with this character. Uh, you know, he, he does a good job with that strong male. And you can't even say lead because he's not the lead character. Christine really is and, and Diana. But, uh, but he is that strong character that is always going to be there. Maybe he's not going to save the day, but he's always there to support his wife, even when she doesn't realize that his way of supporting her is not what she wants, but what she needs. Now, we're going to talk about the the youngest member of this family real quick before we get to really kind of one of the stars of the show. But there is Billy Gadsden plays Bob's, uh, short for Roberta. And she's the little girl. She's I, I really liked her performance. I thought she was a, a fun, uh, you know, child actor. She did a really good job with the relationship with the mother with the Christina character. Uh, she's kind of that precocious little smart mouth kid that doesn't want anyone to, you know, she's not interested in making friends with the new nanny. She's kind of that standoffish kid that just wants things to be the way they are and doesn't want anything new uh, introduced into their little uh, ecosystem. But Billy Gadsden does a really good job with this character. She does a good job with the the range of emotion that she's got to to work with as a, a as a child actor. She's going to play the the typical precocious kid. She's going to play sad when she you know her bird dies. She has to play the anger when she blames her father. The one moment where her and and Diana are at the grave that they created for this little bird, uh, this little yellow canary that they call Big Bird. She turns around and sees her father standing in the window and just says, murderer. It's just the the vitriol and the contempt in in how she said that was just so i mean that's that's how kids can be sometimes they're they're visceral in their their emotions their emotions are raw they're not contained or controlled uh, and, and she did a good job with that now one of the real stars of the show is the diana character played by chai foncier and she she did a fantastic job uh for an actress that I'm not really familiar with it all. I mean, she's she's done some acting, but for the most part, everything or 
television series and, and movies and things like that in the Philippines. She is a Fil- Filipina actress and actually accomplished singer and songwriter as well in the Philippines. But she plays the character Diana, who is this nanny that mysteriously shows up and kind of insinuates herself into this home. And she's at first very helpful and very kind and very accommodating. But as as things progress, uh, she just becomes more curious of a character. And there are things that are said that are, are, are a little dark and mysterious. She's talking about, at one point, talking about Christine being happy. She's saying this in English. And then she says in her, her native tongue, uh, for now, we only see that because we see that in the subtitle. And, and we know, oh my God, Christine, something's wrong here. But she doesn't know. She doesn't understand the language of the Philippines. And and we see this character, Diana, start to incorporate some really weird, ritualistic, almost witchcraft, for lack of a better term. Scooping ash from a fireplace and, and putting this newspaper covered in ash down in front of her door. Uh, waiting for footprints to show up in it. Uh, She has this little shrine she creates that she kind of keeps hidden from the rest of the family. She finds this tick, uh, a very engorged tick walking around. She keeps it in a little matchbox. And just really weird things that you understand right away that this woman is not all she's cracked up to be. Even when she opens her suitcase and you see very little clothes, but all these little... Uh, boxes and baubles that that look like something out of some sort of ancient uh, ritual. And this character, Diana, uh, slowly goes from being a nanny to Bob's and, and a kind of a housekeeper and cook and just kind of all around caretaker for this family. She goes from that to being Christine's alternative medicine caregiver. Uh, she starts using these ritualistic ways to heal alternatively on Christina and starts getting results. Christina starts feeling better. She stops having the tremors and and she starts remembering things better. She kind of dives deeper into Diana's uh, folk remedies for the ailments that she is having. But Chai Foncier uh, does a really good job with this character and this role because she does come across as that that kindly woman that is there to, to be the nanny and take care of everyone. And she just seems like she's there. She just wants to help. But then when it starts to get into some really weird territory where you're not sure what her intentions are for this, you you get that sense of unease in her performance that you understand that there's something deeper going on here that you can't quite put your finger on it. But, or, or in my case, I put my finger on it right away and, and I'm not the only one, but in, in best case scenario, you can't quite put your finger on what's going on. And then when we get to that climax and she is full blown, you, her intentions are made clear. Then that performance is, is very foreboding and very, I don't want to say menacing because this isn't about menace. This is about retribution. This had some some notes of, of gothic horror, but also had a lot of notes of folk horror. I'd call this a folk horror before I'd call it gothic horror. By any stretch of the imagination, but gothic horror usually entails ghosts from the past and secrets of the past coming to light. And, and you really had that dynamic in this uh, on underneath lying underneath the surface of all the folk horror aspects of this movie so that really is kind of the basic premise of this movie there's no real big twists or turns in this it is fairly straightforward you've got this nanny who who has some sort of ulterior motive for what she's doing you're not even 100 percent sure that she was uh, showing up at the behest of Christine because Christine can't remember anything. She's a very unreliable uh, narrator, so to speak. And you're half wondering what Diana is doing here. Why is she here? Uh, it, it's for more than just taking care of the family. She's got some ulterior motives. And, and throughout this movie, that's all we see is her relationship with Christine. Uh, she is trying to alleviate some of her her maladies but there's just a 
like I said, there's an ulterior motive feeling behind all of it. And then she's trying to make friends with Roberta or Bob's, the, the daughter of Felix and Christine. And when asked about her gifts as a healer, she tells this story about how there's this woman. She was a healer, a shaman, if you will, uh, type character in the village. She was dying and she came to her uh, Diana's mother's home and was was dying and and Diana was the only one in the room when the woman finally passed and it's said that uh, when one of these uh, healers one of these shaman dies uh, their spirit passes on into somebody else and because Diana was the only one in the room the spirit passed on to her and she gained all the powers and the knowledge. Uh, it kind of, it almost felt like a collective knowledge. Like, you know, whatever passes from one shaman to the next is a communal hive mind spirit that collects all the, the other existences from the, the ones that came before and, and passes it on to this, this next person. And, and the way they represent this was really disgusting. This, this old woman is lying there dying and this like creepy bird creature comes out of her mouth and then it goes into the, the young actress playing a young Diana and goes into her mouth. And just as soon as I'm seeing this, that's all I can think of is, well, this is, not so subtle foreshadowing and that we are going to see this passed on into Bob's somehow. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to happen. Uh, somebody was going to kill Diana, uh, maybe Felix, maybe Christine. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to play out, but I knew she was going to die eventually and that whatever was in her was going to be passed on to Roberta or Bob's, the, the young child of Felix and Christine. And much like that, uh, the other thing that really should have been a mystery as to what Diana's reasons for all this were is uh, was, was really easy to discern as well. Once you realized that Christine, at the beginning of the movie, when she gets this phone call and they're talking about pulling bodies from the wreckage and, and that sort of thing, once you realize it wasn't Bob's, it wasn't Felix that died, it only took a, a couple minutes to process that, well, she is a designer. She's going out and having all these clothes manufactured on her own. She's using some sort of a sweatshop. It's th something we joke about now with, with any sort of clothing line is that it's made in some sweatshop in some third world country. Uh, it's probably not a joke and it shouldn't, maybe it shouldn't be a joke, but, but that's, you know, that's the first place people's minds go to when you think of clothing lines and things like that. So it wasn't a stretch to think that Christina, uh, Christine's clothes were made in some sweatshop and Diana, somebody she knew, uh, I, you know, the thought of a daughter had crossed my mind. I, I was thinking maybe an older daughter, but you know, a lot of, a lot of sweatshops use young kids. So the fact that maybe Maybe her daughter died in in some accident, whether it be a fire, whether it was a building collapse. I wasn't quite sure. Uh, they didn't really clearly state how what sort of accident happened at the beginning, just that an accident happened. So, you know, it was quite easy to put two and two together that somebody she knew and loved, probably a daughter, died in the sweatshop that Christine owned or was actually using to to make her clothing line, and she was coming to get revenge with, with her folk, shaman, witchcraft powers. And that's pretty much how it all played out. I mean, like I said, the, the two things that should have been big mysteries or big surprises just really weren't surprises. You kind of saw them coming a mile away. And that's that was probably my biggest or, or only real complaint is that the, the two things that probably should have been saved for a big reveal or, or some big aha moment uh, were easy to telegraph. You could you could see it coming a mile away. Now, that didn't take away from it being a good movie. I, I really did enjoy this movie. I thought it had some really interesting moments. The, the scene with the dog at the beginning was really creepy and bizarre. A lot of the hallucinations that Christine has are bizarre and unnerving. There's a scene where this bird, this big bird uh, canary that Bob's has, Felix has just come from Diana's room where he's telling her to leave Christine alone, stay out of her head. And, and Diana really bucks right up against him. He's a, he's a 
she's, you know, she's a very short woman. He's a big, you know, strong, tall man. And she doesn't back down from him one bit. And, and as he leaves the room, she tells him to get out. And as he leaves the room, she says, watch the stairs. Be careful on the stairs. And as he's walking to the stairs, uh, Big Bird like buzzes by him. And you think, oh my God, he's going to fall down the stairs and break his neck or something. And he doesn't, which is like, okay it built all that tension and then just left you there hanging and then there's a scene later on where he's walking towards the stairs and big bird is dive bombing him and he does fall down the doesn't fall down the stairs but he falls over the the railing and and lands on the on the floor below and ends up having to be taken to the hospital which conveniently so he's not around when when all the shit goes down for the climax, but but it was really creepy because you know it paid off what they set up earlier, which I thought was a really good way to do that. You know, set it up to where you think something's going to happen, you know it's going to happen, and it doesn't happen, and then to pay it off later was nice. And then to, that weird creepiness where this bird has actually been dead because he actually swatted it out of the air the first time uh, that the bird dive bombed him above the stairs and and swatted him it hit the wall or something and died and you saw that little tick crawl out from it uh, essentially diana was controlling it with a tick and then like i said when it when it happens again and and felix actually does fall uh, the bird has been dead for a while now and so it's it's a a bird spirit i don't know what it is but it just adds a, a level of creepiness to it there's that one scene where Christine is in bed and she, it's kind of one of those dream within a dream within a dream sort of situations where, uh, you know, something scary happens. She wakes up and then something more rather scary happens. She wakes up again and then something scary happens. You know, it's something that's been done a, a million times in horror, but this was creepy because <laughs> this giant tick was crawling up her chest and uh, you know, giant bugs are always creepy. Ticks are always creepy. Uh, it was just a, a gross, unnerving scene. And the fact that they did it all with, uh, you know, practical puppetry and animatronics or whatever uh, just made it all the creepier. It wasn't some shitty CG bug crawling up her. It was it was something real and tangible that you could you could see the weight of it. And, and I really like that. And that's, oh, like I said, uh, the, the thought of a big giant tick crawling up me. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, thought of a little tick crawling up me kind of creeps me out, but but a big giant tick that just <laughs> that sent me that sent me over the edge uh, in the the creep factor. But for me, one of the best moments was how this thing ended, because you have uh, Christine going through this regiment from from Diana to to reveal what's what's causing her problem, and she almost has Diana in a sweatshop type situation where she's locked in a room and it's hot and she's sweating and she's sitting there sewing away just like the people in this fire that broke out in the in the factory that killed Diana's daughter, almost like the conditions there. And we had that creepy scene there at the very end when Diana is in this room and I don't, you know, it's, it's not really on fire. She's envisioning being in the flames of this, of this factory, but she sees the, the burned body of Diana's daughter walk up to her and, and then it cuts to Felix showing up, coming back from the hospital and he walks upstairs and he, he goes into this room and sees the charred remains of Christine. Like her feet are, are fine, but the rest of her like singed up and, and just, it's just, it was, I don't know whether it was supposed to be, com, you know, spontaneous combustion or some spirit you know the the ghost of her daughter burned her or maybe it's the magic of of what diana uh the powers that she has that that caused christine to to burst into flames but now she's just a smoldering corpse sitting there at the sewing machine and it was oh jesus it was it was creepy and disturbing to look at and then while this is going on, Diana goes up to the roof of the house as she sends uh, Bob's down to watch for her and to look up. And Diana swan dives off the, the top of the house 
and dies. And of course, Bob's is the only one there. And yes, we see that little bird creature come out of her mouth and go into Bob's mouth. And we end this with Bob's in the woods uh, collecting herbs. And she looks off at this tree and kind of sees the, the spirit of Diana watching over her. Because one of Bob's biggest fears was just to be left alone. Her, her mother always left her alone. Her dad's always working. She just always felt alone. And it felt like she didn't have a family. And all she wanted was to know that somebody was going to be there with her forever. And and Diana gave her that promise and fulfilled that promise by putting the spirit of all these shaman women that came before her and herself into Bob's. And she's always looking out for her. But ultimately, this was a really cool movie. I, I really like this. I, I like the reveal at the end. Y you understand what is going on, but you don't know exactly how it went on. And you do get that reveal at the end, how uh, after Diana... Her daughter is killed in this fire. She sees a stray dog across the streets and uses her her powers to send a, a specter of this dog infected with with ticks to Christine to infect her because she looks at Christine like a parasite, somebody who only uses people until she gets what she wants and then leaves them and much like the the victims of the fire in this in this warehouse that was manufacturing. Uh, her line of clothes. I really enjoyed the care that, you know, a director like Lorcan Finnegan uh, put into creating a a story that was was fairly accurate to the the source material in so much as the the lore and the folk tradition of of the Philippines. I, I know he traveled to the Philippines, talked to some of the shamans or the, uh, I believe they're called Ongo to, to make sure what they were doing was authentic to what, what these characters would be doing. So I liked that they, they really put in a lot of care and, and the fact that this is a joint Irish and Filipino production, I think uh, is, is fascinating to see these two cultures at play, you know, working together to create uh, a, a really good horror movie. And I have to give a tip of the hat not only to, to Lorcan Finnegan for directing this, but also to Garrett Shanley, who wrote this. Hey, he also wrote Vivarium, too. Just a, a well-written movie. I mean, it was it was done well. Uh, like I said, I, I really wish the two kind of big reveals or things that should have been big reveals, uh, the reveal of this this Ongo uh, spirit going into Bob's, I wish that would have been kept a little more secret and been a little more of a surprise. You saw it coming away after uh, Diana told the story of that happening to her as a kid. Uh, and also the... Uh, reveal that Diana's lost somebody in this fire and is, is coming to seek her revenge. You really kind of saw that coming a mile away as well. Those are my only two real problems with that because other than that, I think, like I said, I think it was directed really well. They weren't groundbreaking as far as shots, but I thought the cinematography was good. I thought the, the lighting and everything was interesting. They, they had some interesting shots. The hallucinations were really cool to watch. Uh, the, the dream sequence with the big giant tick was pretty cool. Uh, they had a lot of really good physical, practical effects in this and a practical makeup and things like that. And any CG work they did do with the flames and Christine's skin blistering as, as it cuts to black and Felix is showing up was all done really well for what I imagine to be a not too terribly big budget. The CG looked better than a lot of movies of this same caliber. And I thought the acting was just phenomenal. Uh, Eva Green is always great. I always enjoy her. She she does such a good job with these complicated characters, like the Christine character, somebody you should be feeling uh, sorry for. But then once everything is kind of revealed and you realize, oh, she's not as good a person as you thought. And, and any sorrow you had for her, you feel like, uh, she just kind of got what she deserved. Evergreen does a good job with characters like that. Uh, you know, Mark Strong does a fantastic job as Felix. Uh, Chai Foncier uh, did a wonderful job as Diana. And for, for an actress I'm not completely familiar with, I, I, there again, it's, it's one of those scenarios where uh, I would like to see her in more things because I, I thought she did a really good job. She played all the facets of this character and, and there were many because she had to come across as the the kind helpful uh, caregiver and then things got a little more mysterious and then things got a little more mysterious and then when she's full-blown 
this is a woman hell bent on revenge. The shades of all this from from one to the, the the end, it just you know that's that's a quite a feat for an actor, and she took it on like a champ and did a really good job. And of course, uh, Billy Gadsden uh, as as Bob's did a really fantastic job as well. So I, I really can't say a, a bad thing about the cast. I thought they all did really well. And much like the movie we talked about on Monday, Spoonful of Sugar, this isn't so much a horror with a bunch of scares in it. There's no jumps, not a lot of jump scares. There may have been a couple minor jump scares with the uh, dream sequence reveals, but but not cheap jump scares. Uh, this really, much like Spoonful of Sugar, was all built on atmosphere and, and creepiness and, and making you feel uncomfortable and making you feel... Uh, you know, what the hell is going on? It, the tension. This was a very tension-driven, a very psychological-driven horror film that at the end really paid off with some some gruesome reveals when you fe- reveal the, the charred remains of Christine. Uh, it's just disgusting. And, and, and some of the body horror with the, the little bird thing coming out of people's mouths was, was gross, but, but done quite well for, for CG work. Uh, like I said, the, the CG work, uh, probably shouldn't have been as good as it was given. I'm sure this was probably a lower budget film, but, but by God, it, it looked, looked pretty good for the most part. And, and I've seen movies that are supposed to be bigger budgeted than this. Uh, not pull off CG that looks as as good and, and competent as the CG in this. And another really interesting thing uh, I'll mention before we kind of wrap things up, but uh, at the very end, when you're running the credits, there is a song by the band The General Strike called uh, Pugon. And it's uh, kind of about the 2015 Kentex Slipper Factory fire. This was like the third worst fire in the Philippines. And, you know, it's it's very much loosely what this movie is based on, uh, kind of the subplot about the the uh, clothing manufacturer that that catches fire and all these people die because they're locked in. And and this is is a similar situation to what happened with the the Kentex Slipper Factory fire in the Philippines and uh, the uh, end credits. Uh, when you get to the part in the credits where it mentions this song, it says justice for all Kentex fire victims. A very interesting story. You have, have to look that up and, and read about that. But like you said, uh, to be able to draw the parallels between that real life incident and, and some of the things that happen in this movie that are, are loosely based on that is, is quite interesting as well. But all in all, I really enjoyed Nis- Sibo. I, I thought it was a really good movie. Was it a perfect movie? No, but but by God, it was it was pretty good. And just adding it to a long list of of really good Shutter original horror films that I've enjoyed over the past, you know, 2022 was just chock full of them, especially right there around Halloween time, September, October, November had a, a crap ton of them. And they're really starting off strong in 2023. So I'm looking forward to more. Now that streak is going to be broken when I finally talk about uh, the new Children of the Corn, which is coming out on Shudder and a Shudder produced movie. But <laughs> we'll, we'll enjoy the ride while it lasts. But, uh, but I've really enjoyed a lot of what Shudder has been doing. And Nocebo is, is one of those really good uh, horror movies. Maybe not Monster Under the Bed, Jump Scares Galore horror movies, but it does very much have a folk horror, psychological horror feel to it that that they pull off really well. And like I said, uh, you got to tip the hat to to the cast and and everybody involved, the writing and director uh, Lorcan Finnegan uh, for for really putting out a, a quality movie. Is it perfect by no stretch of the imagination? Like I said, uh, a couple things were really quite predictable, but still quite enjoyable. So I want to thank everybody for listening to my thoughts. Go check out Nocebo on Shudder if you haven't watched it. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to my thoughts on it for the past however long we've been talking about this. Uh, you can check out more at Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop on Facebook, where we're posting trailers to latest uh, films and series out, as well as sharing articles we find all over the internet, adding my two thoughts. Uh, check us out on Instagram as well. And no matter where you listen to this podcast, please follow it, subscribe to it, like it, whatever you got to do. And as always, share with anyone that you know that loves horror, fantasy, and science fiction. Help us get the word out. And leave those reviews. Five stars would be awesome. But whatever review you leave, we do appreciate that. So until next time. 
Thank you for visiting Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop. We hope that you found something to your liking and visit the shop again soon. But even though you may come back, you never really get to leave Odds Bodkin's Curiosity Shop. Ha 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 ha!